they say, and I'm glad I don't know them. <laughs> but in, in this case, uh, Jacob Francis is definitely a person that I, I would love to have gotten to know and, and would, would do so if, uh, if I could. So let me get rid of that. Okay. Um, but anyway, again, I, I thank you for uh, your uh, attendance tonight and, and to learn about Jacob. Um, if you take a look at the cover of, of the book, it kind of shows you geographically his world. He's going to be associated with the area of uh, central uh, western New Jersey in the Flemington Trenton area. He's going to spend some time in uh, around New York City, and he's going to spend some time in Salem, Massachusetts, and Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, so he's he's got a, a for that time period a, a pretty uh, well ex expanded world. The flags show you the time period of his world, the British flag from uh, when he was born, the uh, Continental flag that was used during the Revolution. Uh, that he served under, and then the American flag uh, from 1836, the, the time that he died. So you see, it's a it's a time thing, and it's also the the movement from one um, governmental system to another. Now, who was Jacob? He was a free black man who was born January 15th, 1754. It's if you know history and particularly uh, black history from this time period, you know that knowing the birth date of a person is, is kind of unusual. Uh, there's not that many good records. And we're very lucky that uh, Jacob uh, actually knew his birth date. Uh, there's no real record of it other than things that he wrote. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. He was born in Amwell Township, which at the time was about one fourth of Hunterdon County. Uh, it's been divided up into many more little townships and all that today. But um, he, he, he was born free. I think that's the important thing. Who his mother's name was, we don't know. Who his father was, we don't know. If he had any siblings, we don't know. We just know that there was Jacob and we know he had a mom because he talks about her at, at times. And we know that she was free also. But the whole family that he was born into is just, she was probably a single mom, to be honest. And uh, he never did know who his father was and, and never had any siblings. But he was very close to mom, as, as you will see. His mother because she was a single mom, perhaps, indentured him out until the age of 21. When she did that, we don't know, but it was probably when he was about seven or eight years old, maybe as late as 10, but probably not later than that. Uh, she may have indentured him out so that he could live in a family uh, with a father and, and with other uh, children. She indentured him out to, local, to a local farmer in Amwell Township, a young farmer, who was married and who actually had no children. But, um, you know, he, he may have, she may have done that so that he could have a father figure, if you will. I don't know. But at any rate, uh, his time was uh, then sold by that man to another farmer. And when I say time, I mean, till age 21, Hopefully you know how indentured servitude works as opposed to enslavement. Um, and he actually went through five owners of his time. And we'll talk about those again in just a little bit. But I think it's important to know that during those, those years of his indenture and then his years as a, as a free man afterwards, he was living during the American Revolution and then afterwards. He was around when the United States was created. We'll see several ways in which he fit into that story. He also lived at a time when there was a revolution in human rights. Enslavement was still 
um, practiced pretty much throughout the 13 colonies and human rights in general were something that people were fighting for and people were struggling to, to attain. And of course that struggle continues today. And we're gonna see how Jacob and then his children were, were very deeply involved in all of this in, in both revolutions. Now, as I said, his indenture time was owned successively by five different white men and their families. Three of them, the first three were farmers and he stayed pretty much in Flemington, or excuse me, in Amwell Township with those three farmers. The merchants, the first merchant took him to New York City. And from New York City, that merchant then took him to St. John in the uh, Virgin Islands, where Jacob probably was fearful that he was gonna get sold into slavery but he wasn't. And that uh, merchant then took Jacob back to Salem, Massachusetts, where he sold uh, Jacob's time to the last of the, the five owners who was a merchant in, in Salem. And he's going to spend over six years with that family in Salem, Massachusetts. And he actually did live in, in the family we know. The family also had several other indentured servants and also several enslaved persons. So he lived in a really a mixed uh, family there. But notice the years that he was there, 1768 to 1775. And you know, in Massachusetts, the Salem, Boston area, this is the time when everything is coming together uh, concerning the, the outbreak of the revolution. So uh, Jacob was, you know, very involved in that. The, the man who owned his indenture time was a strong patriot and was, was involved in, in the revolution. Now, on January the 15th, 1775, while living in Salem, Jacob's um, indenture ran out. That's one reason he knew his birth date, by the way. He knew that he was going to be free from his indenture on his 21st birthday. So no way am I going to forget that. Also, if you know the term indentured servant, uh, it was done by contract. And the contract had to have the birth date of the individual so that they would know when to uh, you know, end the indenture and have complete freedom for the person. So that's how we know his birth date. But now what's he going to do as a free man in Salem, Massachusetts? far away from his home of birth anyway, far away from his mother, far away from the community that he was a child in. Probably he's gotten associated enough in Massachusetts that he can, can do something. But even as a free black man, he's gonna have trouble um, getting along in the world and, survi and surviving economically. But he decides to stay there, at least for a while. He gets some odd jobs, probably with the help of that man who had owned his indenture time. And just to see how he's involved in the beginnings of the revolution, about a month after he gets his freedom, British troops come to Salem to remove some cannon that the Patriots are, are hiding out. Uh, they are going to have to cross the, the river there and there's a drawbridge and there, there's a, a standoff between the, the local militia and the British troops that could have resulted in uh, the troops firing on each other. But fortunately, they didn't and things were solved peacefully, at least in February. But then, oops, then in April, of uh, that year, we know that Lexington and Concord uh, came about. And again, the British were coming looking for uh, some people, but also looking for artillery pieces and other uh, munitions in Salem and, and Con excuse me, in Lexington and Concord. And that's when the, the fighting and the revolution did uh, break out. Uh, Jacob wasn't there for that, but the man he had been indentured to was involved in militia that uh, went involved with that. So he's there right at the, the beginnings. He hangs around uh, 
Salem for a little bit longer as the militia is formed and then the, the Continental Army is formed. But now what's he going to do for the rest of his life? Uh, possibly, like a lot of young men who needed a steady job, he's going to enlist in the Continental Army. It may also be that he certainly wanted to join the Continental Army because of the beliefs that he would be fighting for and the, the future world that he would be fighting for. So we don't know for sure, but th there are some indications that he was definitely uh, concerned about winning independence and winning freedoms. It wasn't just a job, but that certainly was, was an enticement also. At the time that he was thinking about enlisting, there was a lot of disagreement over whether black men should be allowed in the army. On October the 8th, Washington and uh, eight of his senior officers, including some from New England, agreed to reject all enslaved men from the Continental Army, and also, not unanimously, but by a great majority of those officers, uh, they agreed to reject uh, Negroes or Black men altogether. Uh, New England had used, uh, had employed Black troops in their militia during the uh, French and Indian War. Uh, they were much more open to uh, Blacks serving beside white men. But um, <clears throat> all of the officers together from all the different uh, states, you know, rejected it. There was a committee from Congress, from the Continental Congress, visiting Washington at that time, and they agreed there should not be any Black men. So the question is, if no Black men are being encouraged to join and are not going to be enlisted if they volunteer, what's going to be uh, Jacob's story? Is he going to be considered to be one of the Black men who may have people look at the Continental Army and consider it to be defective because they had Blacks? Uh, if he if he didn't behave himself, he would definitely be expelled. But even if he behaved himself, it didn't look good. The last day of October in 75, Washington's general orders to his troops were uh, that because a lot of officers had been enlisting men in the Continental Army and apparently had been enlisting some Black men, he said that should stop immediately and any enlistments, particularly to Black men, should be returned. He also put into general orders that any person except a Black man who, come, who came to the uh, recruiting office, signed an enlistment, would be immediately supplied with clothing. But don't go if you're a Black man, okay? So it was clearly uh, the card stacked against Jacob for joining the army. However, sometime in late October, right while all of that that we just talked about was going on, somehow he enlisted for one year at Cambridge. One year was the typical uh, time that men, all men were enlisting for at that time. Um, it, they, everybody thought the war was going to be over, and so they only were setting up an army to last for one year. So he was signing up for the full full term. <clears throat> Excuse me. He signed into the regiment commanded by Colonel Paul Dudley Sargent, who was uh, from the Salem area. He had his family had contacts in Salem. Uh, Jacob may have, have known him. That may be why he went to sign in to Sargent's regiment. There may have been other people that he knew in the regiment already. He may have known even some of the officers. Uh, but this is where he's going to serve for a year. He, enjoy, he signed into Captain John Wiley's company. Wiley, again, is another man from that, that portion of, of Massachusetts. And from all we can tell, he was um, there, there was no doubt that these guys were happy to have him in their company and in their in their regiment. Now on November 12th, you know, this is what, maybe a week or two after Jacob enlisted, the general orders came back again and said, neither Negroes 
boys unable to bear arms, nor old men unfit to endure the fatigues of the campaign, were to be enlisted. However, there left the recruiters some leeway. What's a young boy? What's an older man? Um, if a boy was big enough and mature enough to, to serve well, they might enlist him. If it was an older man still strong enough to serve, they might enlist him. They didn't give any age uh, restrictions. They just said old or young. So that's very much uh, a judgment call. The only one that wasn't a judgment call was black men. No leeway allowed. None should be accepted. That was the order. Orders don't always get followed. In practice, at least some recruiters apparently decided to use judgment regarding black recruits. And if they had a black man whom they thought would be a really good soldier and wouldn't bring any disgrace to them or their unit, they, they would take him on. So apparently Jacob fit into that category and maybe he was because he was known to either the colonel or the captain that I talked about before, or some of the men in the regiment already. Somebody backed him up, apparently. And so he was uh, offered an enlistment. Now, at this time, at Cambridge, the British Army was in Boston, and the Continental Army kind of surrounded Boston and had the, the British under siege there. And where the regiment was that Jacob enlisted in, uh, you see the uh, yellow area, the Inman Farm uh, near Leshmere Point and near Cambridge College or Cambridge, uh, the town of Cambridge. Uh, that's where they were. And he remained there for several months. You know, he's, he enlists at the end of October and the British aren't going to leave Boston until the following March. So in those intermediate months, he's serving right there in, in uh, Cambridge. After the British left Boston, his unit was uh, taken down to the Roxbury area and could go over the uh, neck that uh, connected, uh, connected Boston to the mainland. And they went uh, to Fort Hill in uh, Boston. And from there, a couple of days later, they were taken to Bunker Hill. And that's where they were, were stationed. After a while at Bunker Hill, they were sent to Castle William Island. And they're going to spend the, basically the rest of their time in that area there. So they're in a number of different places. They're going to get out of Boston in July. And just two days before they left, really, Jacob heard the Declaration of Independence read on Boston Common on July the 18th. They had left Castle William and gone to Boston in order to get ready to go to New York City. Uh, but Washington had taken most of his troops to New York a little earlier, and they were prepared to meet the, the British there. So he, this is just before he leaves Boston, he hears the Declaration. And of course, the Declaration, we have to remember, changed the Army's mission greatly uh, and, and, and quickly. What had been a war fighting for rights, the rights of British citizens to be applied to the people in the colonies and you know, to be good Englishmen, so to speak, and strengthening this loose community of 13 uh, colonies who were known as the United Colonies, not the United States yet, uh, but all fighting for the same uh, uh, effort to get uh, rights of Englishmen. Now it becomes a war for independence and they're essentially not good citizens of England trying to uh, promote equal rights for Englishmen. Now they are traitors trying to establish their own country. So it changes very much who might be interested in continuing to serve in the Continental Army. Uh, Jacob does continue to serve us. He's not to serve. He's not one of the, the men who uh, kind of deserts from the Continental Army at that point because they don't believe in the, the cause anymore. Well, from uh, Boston, 
his unit is taken to the area around near Manhattan. They travel uh, by boat through Long Island Sound to uh, Hellgate on the, at the entrance to the East River. And just across from there, there's a, a place called Horns Hook which I believe today is right about where the uh, mayor mayor's residence is uh, of New York City. And so they're right on the, the East River. And they build, there, there is a fort that they add to. Uh, you see it there at Horns Hook. And the arrow comes from a, an illustration of what that fort looked like from ground level. And you can see that it is right on the river. There's boats and everything like that right off the coast. Right across the East River from them is Hallett's Point. Now, Hallett's Point was actually part of Long Island. And by the time uh, uh, <laughs> Jacob's regiment gets to Horn's Hook to establish their fortifications there, the Battle of Long Island uh, has been taking place and the British now come up and they fortify Hallett's Point and establish artillery there. So for several weeks, Jacob's experience in New York City is gonna be dodging artillery shells from the British bombarding them at Horn's Hook. Getting into September then, they are gonna actually have to abandon Horn's Hook and make their way up Manhattan Island into uh, the area of Harlem Heights and they're going to be involved in the battle there on September the 15th. And that's a battle that they are going to be right in the thick of. They were they were right in, in the front lines on one of the wings. And so Jacob is definitely going to be involved in the Battle of Harlem Heights. That was a battle that was not a complete victory for the British. It was kind of a stalemate. Uh, the Americans were not forced to, to leave. They stayed in the upper area of Manhattan Island until they uh, left and then went into Westchester County where they would fight the Battle of White Plains towards the end of October. So no, it's about you know five, six weeks after the Battle of Harlem Heights that they, they fight at White Plains. After the Battle of White Plains, this is also a battle that the British don't out and out win and the Americans retreat to some very defensive positions. And General Howe just kind of pulls back a bit trying to, to figure out what he wants to do. There's just movement around and Washington eventually comes over to uh, New Jersey. And then uh, General Cornwallis, uh, driven by, ordered by General Howe, follows after him and Washington crosses late November until December 1st, he arrives at Trenton, and then he crosses the Delaware River into Bucks County, Pennsylvania <clears throat> during the first week of December. Well, Jacob is not with Washington when he's crossing New Jersey. He's still back at uh, near, near uh, White Plains. But then on December the 2nd, those troops that Washington left behind under General Lee cross into New Jersey, and you can see the, the route that they took. And by about September, excuse me, December uh, the 9th, they are outside of Morristown uh, in the area of Basking Ridge. And this is where General Lee gets taken captive by the British. And Jacob, the, it's in quotes here because this is a statement from Jacob that he heard the guns firing and the next morning uh, he and his uh, regiment continued on the march to New Jersey and crossed the Delaware and then came down the east side of um, the Delaware River in, in Bucks County all the way to uh, Coriol, uh, to uh, McConkie's Ferry. And you know what happened at McConkie's Ferry on December the night of December 25th, just about three days after Jacob got there, this is when Washington is going to cross the Delaware. So Jacob crosses the Delaware with Washington. I would just point out briefly, he was probably one of the very few men born in New Jersey 
who crossed the Delaware with Washington. There were very few, if any, New Jersey troops outside of a couple of militiamen who were going to serve as guides for Washington and some recruits for some New Jersey regiments. But other than that, the active New Jersey regiments were up in the Fort Ticonderoga area. They weren't uh, down here. So very few New Jerseyans crossed. Jacob crossed because he was fighting in a Massachusetts regiment. And there were a lot of Massachusetts um, men in, at this time. Once they crossed the river at McConkie's and Johnson's Ferry, they then marched first as a single group and then at what was known then as the town of Birmingham, today it's West Trenton, they split into two groups, uh, the Solid Arrow, uh, the groups under Washington and General Green, and the uh, Split Arrow under General Sullivan. And Jacob went with Sullivan's group uh, down along the Delaware River to attack Trenton. Once they got to Trenton, and you can see here the, the heart of Trenton is this triangular uh, two roads that almost meet at a point uh, known as King and Queen Street. Today, if you know Trenton, that's Warren and Broad Street. Uh, and if you know the town, you know the, the barracks would be right here. <clears throat> They're gonna come in this river road. This is Sullivan's route that coming in. And they're going to march right beside the barracks, practically, coming into Trenton. When they get to this intersection, uh, King Street and 2nd and Street, or what is today uh, State Street, Jacob, in his uh, statement uh, later on, says that he was able to look up King Street, and he could see that Washington and Green had attacked from well up the street, and had the Hessians out in the street uh, with artillery fighting back and forth with each other. And, you know, he, Jacob didn't know, are they gonna turn up the street and get into that fight or what's gonna happen? But their, their group was actually confronted by another Hessian group, the Gniefhausen Regiment, which had been stationed down in the, the lower part of Trenton. And so part of Sullivan's group is gonna take them on, and the other group, which Jacob was a part of, the darker blue, they're going to go across a stone bridge on the Assenpink Creek at the grist mill, and then they're going to form up on what was known as Mill Hill, uh, right across uh, from Trenton on the Assenpink Creek, primarily to uh, make sure that no Hessians kind of escaped that way. Now, the Hessians who had been fighting up in the middle of town, actually moved just a little out of town into a apple orchard. And they were defeated at that point by uh, Washington's and Green's troops. Once um, they were done, the Kniefhausen Regiment, at the same time they'd been fighting, retreated closer to the Assenpink Creek. And after Colonel Rawl and two regiments had surrendered the American troops then could go and attack the Kniefhausen Regiment from really three sides, uh, from uh, the front, from what would be their back, and also what would be their front uh, uh, at Mill Hill. So then those guys are gonna surrender. And Jacob in his statement about the Battle of Trenton talks about seeing the Hessians uh, putting their arms on the ground and surrendering and all of that. And then, of course, he's going to be one of the people who helps, because all of Washington's troops did, helps take those Hessian prisoners, the 900 or so, back over to Pennsylvania. Well, on December 31st, five days after the Battle of Trenton, which was December 26, Jacob's enlistment expires. Almost all of the Continental Army's enlistments expired that day. Washington begged the men to extend their enlistments for four to six weeks. And, you know, at least half of them or so did. Jacob did not extend, even for the $10 bounty that Washington offered. Jacob had been serving for, 12, for, for 14 months. 
I said he's uh, enlisted for a year, but he enlisted before that year would start. So he actually had two extra months. He had survived terrible warfare, disease, all kinds of problems in that those 14 months. Um, the army owed him seven and a half months pay. They owed him over half the time that he had served. He hadn't been paid. So he's not real happy about it. None of the men are real happy about that. They would only give him a verbal discharge and they would only give him three months back pay if he, if he stayed or whether he left. So he's going to leave. Now, I want you to think, here he is, a black man in a ragged military uniform and no discharge papers. Is he a deserter? Is he a runaway enslaved person who found a uniform, uh, who, who's just putting things together? At this, at this time in New Jersey, white people who came into contact with a black man would assume he was enslaved unless he could prove otherwise. Jacob can't prove anything, but he has all the appearance of being a deserter or a runaway. But somehow he survives. The reason he wanted to get out of the army was not because of his disagreements with the army, but because he was only 15 miles from where he'd been born. He hadn't seen his mother for about a decade. They didn't write to each other because they were both illiterate. So he had no idea if his mom was still even alive. So he went looking for her and somehow he avoided being taken into custody by, by white people thinking he was a deserter or whatever. He may have run into people that he knew from his childhood, for example. But he found his mother and found that she was alive, although pretty sick. But what he really wanted to find out from her was his name. He only knew his name was Jacob. He didn't know his family name. He had adopted the name spelled G-U-L-I-C-K-Gulick, -G but pronounced like an H, uh, a Dutch name. And um, that was the name he used in the Continental Army. When he went and found his mother, he found out that his family name was Francis. So he dropped the Hewlett and he was known as Jacob Francis for the rest of his life. Uh, it would be interesting if there were any records from his regiment that survived, which none did, that had names on them. They only counted the number of men. They didn't list the names of the men. If they had listed the names of the men, you never would have found Jacob Francis. You would have found Jacob Ulick. But anyway, he now has his legitimate family name, and now he wants to make a life for himself. He was almost 23 years old, and he wants to build a, a settled life for himself. Believe it or not, within three years, he owned a house and 46 acres of land in Amwell at a time when black men were, by law, not supposed to be able to own land. Somehow, just like he somehow got enlisted when he wasn't supposed to be accepted, he also was able to obtain land when he wasn't supposed to be able to. And in the, 18, in the 1780 Amwell tax records, he's one of only two free black men listed as owning land. That's how rare it was. I mean, because there were, there were hundreds of, well, there were hundreds of enslaved black men, but there were dozens of free black men who could have owned land. He signed into his local militia company in Amwell Township. The captain was Philip Snook. Believe it or not, Philip Snook was the brother-in-law of a man named Henry Wambaugh, who was the first owner of Jacob's indenture time. So he undoubtedly knew the man whose regiment that he, he, he signed into. And Philip Stook was probably very glad to get him because he's a veteran. He's not an amateur like most of the militiamen, you know, part-time. He, he learned a lot serving in the Continental Army. As a militiaman for the rest of the war, the next six years, Jacob went on many uh, tours of duty to eastern New Jersey, uh, not far from U uh, Union in, in many ways. He was definitely in, in Essex County a number of times. 
and he was involved in several engagements with the with the British, including uh, one near Newark, where he was captured and briefly held by some Hessians, but was able to escape. Uh, they turned their back for a little bit, and he he got the heck out of there and got back to his unit. So he had quite a, an interesting time in the militia. However, spending so much time in the militia made his farming not work so well. And he actually lost his farm. But he came back again in 1789. Now think about 1789. What happened that year? Constitution goes into effect. We become the United States of America. George Washington becomes president and begins his term. And Jacob is 35 years old and ready to start a family. That year, he married an enslaved 23-year-old woman named Mary. Her enslaver was a man named Nathaniel Hunt. And Jacob got to know uh, Mary through him. And he arranged for the marriage because, you know, if he's going to marry an enslaved girl, but he's got to get permission from her enslaver. And Nathaniel Hunt not only gave permission, but then he agreed to sell Mary to Jacob on their wedding day. Nathaniel could not just free her to get married, because if he did that for the rest of Mary's life, Nathaniel would have been responsible economically if she ever needed assistance. You know, if she ever needed welfare, anything like that, Nathaniel would be responsible. But if he sold Mary to Jacob, and then Jacob freed her, Jacob would be responsible for her for the rest of his life. Uh, so anyway, it, it's a it, very interesting situation that tells a lot about enslavement in New Jersey during that time. There's the question that we just don't know the answer to who her parents were. I think it's very possible Nathaniel Hunt was her father. Um, she never mentions a father. Uh, she never mentions mother, siblings, or anything like that. We do know that she lived the major portion of her life with Nathaniel Hunt. And in many ways, she and Nathaniel were more like father and daughter than they were than they were enslaver and enslaved. To the degree that when Jacob and Mary had children, they named two of their boys, one of them Nathaniel and the other one with the middle name Hunt. Uh, there, there was apparently a, a good relationship between those families. Not the usual sort of thing with enslavement, but maybe a little bit of an unusual situation. By 1801, he had established a 115-acre farm in Flemington, just outside of Flemington, and that was probably the farm that appeared on an 1851 map uh, as owned by his son, Nathaniel, the one named after the enslaver. Uh, but an 1851 map, uh, the name Francis appears there. And from all indications, that would have been the original farm that, Nathan that uh, Jacob started. Jacob and Mary moved into the town of Flemington around 1810 and rented a house from the Baptist church on the corner of today's Church Street and Main Street. They're right, you know, right on the edge, but uh, right inside the town of, of Flemington. Uh, they're the only black couple that are renting a house or own a house. Other black people live in Flemington, but they are all servants, slaves or whatever, and they live in the house of their employer or their enslaver. Uh, Jacob and Mary lived in, in their own place. They made a name for themselves selling, making and selling ginger cakes and homemade root beer, especially to the school board across the street and the teachers across the street at a private school that was created about 1810. It was a school for white kids. But it's my firm belief that Jacob and Mary uh, after introducing themselves to that school with the ginger cakes and root beer, uh, made friends with the, the staff there and got them to educate their children on the side, even though their children couldn't go to that school, because all of their children learned to read and write. 
In 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Jacob marched with other veterans uh, from the courthouse, the county courthouse in Flemington, to the Presbyterian Church for a, a very elaborate ceremony that day. And notice, this is just up the street from where he lives. Several years later, in 1829, he's going to give up the rented house from the Baptist Church, and he's actually going to purchase a house on Main Street across the way, owned by the carpenter, Peter Hayward, uh, who's going to practically live right next to him, and his, house, his shop is going to be right next to him. Uh, Jacob and Mary are going to live in a white neighborhood. Again, they're the only Black people owning a house in um, Flemington at that time. In 1832, Jacob is going to apply for a veteran's pension for the revolution. That's great because all of those quotes that we've seen, all those statements about his life and whatnot, came from his pension application when he made that. To make that uh, application, he only had to walk about three or four blocks up the street to that courthouse and swear uh, this oath out, swear this uh, uh, statement out to the, tr the truth of the statement uh, to a court, uh, a judge actually in the court. And that courthouse is still there today. This is still the courthouse. Uh, it was built actually in 1828 uh, four years before he did his, his pension application. And obviously it's been added too, but the, the core of the building is, is still there. Jacob dictated his will in 1836 and notice that he still signs with his mark. He's not literate yet, but two of his sons signed with their signatures. They, they could read and write. And again, one of them is Nathaniel. His will raises a very interesting question. He bequeathed sums of money to each of his children. To his son, Francis, and notice it's my son, Asa Francis, okay? He gave a certain amount of money. And then the next item, he bequeathed unto Phoebe, the daughter of my uh, beloved wife, Mary. Phoebe is the only one of his nine children that he uses that phrasing with. Every other child, he uses the my son or my daughter phrasing. Phoebe was also the firstborn child and was only born a, not too many months after they were married. So she was apparently pregnant at the time that she got married and, and Jacob uh, was not the father. Again, who was the father? We don't know. Was it Nathaniel? Was it one of his uh, grown sons? Was it a friend? Yeah, who knows? Now, when Jacob Francis died uh, in 1836, the local newspaper in Flemington uh, was edited by a white man uh, who normally only did death notices of people by giving their name, when they died, where they died, perhaps what they died of. But it was like a line or two. Jacobs is the longest death notice that the editor wrote for that whole year. Nobody got as much uh, space as Jacob did. And he talked about Jacob's 30 year membership in the Baptist church, how he raised a large family in such a great manner and lived to see them doing well that he served and had such great conduct in the, the military and the revolution and was remarked upon by his officers. And lastly, the editor says he was deservedly respected by all who knew him. This is a very unusual uh, statement about a black man at that time. Uh, and it just, to me, goes to show that Jacob's personality and his, his way of dealing with people and the way of his dealing with the racism of his time and everything like that, he was just a, a spectacular person. And I wanted to find his uh, tombstone if I could, but if you know black history at this time in the 1830s, when blacks died, they very seldom got a tombstone. They were lucky if anybody 
recorded, you know, where they were buried. But I went to the Baptist Church Cemetery right there. Uh, the brick building you see right here is the, the back of the current uh, modern Baptist Church. And then the cemetery is right behind it. I went looking in that cemetery, walking all around it, you know, looking for Jacob's tombstone. And then all of a sudden, I just looked over uh, this tombstone that you see the arrow pointing to. And by golly, there I saw in memory of Jacob Francis, who died and then gives his death date. I couldn't believe it. He's surrounded by the tombs of white people. He's not in a, in, in a black cemetery. Next to him is the tombstone for his wife, Mary. Now, when I was looking for these, I ran into several people from that Baptist church, uh, trustees who were checking the outside of the building for some work that was going to be done on it. And when they saw me walking around the cemetery, looking at the stones, they asked if they could help me. Well, this was just after I had found their tombstones. So I said, no, I, thanks, but I just found what I was looking for. I said, do you know who these two people are? And they said, no, I have no idea. They didn't know they were black. They didn't know Jacob was a veteran. Uh, the, I don't think you see any in the picture here, but veterans, they had flags marking them, you know, veteran markers, but nothing for Jacob. So I enlightened the church and we were able to get a veterans marker for him. And then just last June, the SAR and the DAR put up an historical marker at the entrance to the cemetery telling about the life of Jacob Francis. So he has now been marked. Uh, people can visit and understand uh, what this man went through in the revolution. And also his son, his youngest son, Abner, became more than just reading and writing educated. He became essentially college educated. Uh, he, he, he was very, very, very good writer, very good speaker. And he joined with Frederick Douglass and actually did some writing for Frederick Douglass. And he noted in one uh, document that he wrote for Frederick Douglass's The, the Liberator uh, and the North Star, I should like to have the world know that the same principles of 76 to throw off the British yoke actuated my father to shoulder his musket and serve through the bloody contest. And not only my father, but the blood of colored men was freely shed that struggle for national independence. His son Abner worked hard in the abolition movement, not just for freedom for enslaved people, but for equal rights for free blacks. So his son took over the, the, the whole project. So we finish up um, taking a look at the world the physical world, as well as the political world of Jacob Francis. And again, he's, he's a man I'd like to meet. Uh, I learned about him by writing, when I was writing some of these other books, and I just uh, and got to think so highly of him, I felt that he needed, he needed a book of his own. So that's the story. And at this point, I would love it if anybody had any questions.